2020 vision. I want to ask a question. How many of you from last week, and I don't remember the exact question, I have it in my notes, but I'd asked us to pray, uh, you know, that the Lord would show us some stuff. How many of you feel like the Lord's been showing you things about the new year for you, your family, your business? Yeah, praise God. Praise God. Uh, 2020 vision, our heart is that, that before this year is over, you're going to have 2020 vision about a lot of things. Not just in your life, but also you're going to have 2020 vision about um, the baby don't like to hear me talk. <laughs> See, I, I shut up and then, you know, it's just like... I've had that to happen before. Um, baby cries like that sometimes when I talk too. So, <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Oh, 2020 vision in every area of your life. Uh, one of the things, and that's one of the reasons I told him I was coming up this morning, is I believe you're going to have 2020 vision about worship before this month is out. A lot of people don't realize that when you worship in a corporate setting, you're not doing it just for you. And I, I, there's scriptural precedents for this all through the scripture. I could go into story after story where God used his people to get other people free by their worship and to win wars and to do all kinds of things. And, and, and here's the cool thing, and you've heard me say this before, the, the best way to get out of any type of oppression or depression or, or anything that's kind of holding you down is to quit thinking about yourself. So sometimes in worship, you, you don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes you don't feel like praising God. Just remember, you may be doing it for your neighbor. And see, it gets the focus in the right place. Yeah. Do it unto others and it'll be done unto you. Yeah. And so these are some things that we're going to talk about. So remember this, vision will guide you, it will motivate you, it'll energize you. As well as your family, your business, your church, really every area of your life. Uh, vision will motivate you. It'll energize you. I've been looking at the uh, some pictures. I've put together a church file of the new building and the project from the start to beginning. I've had the pictures, but when you go to digging through 25,000 digital pictures, it takes a little time to do that because uh, they're all on my computer. But I was looking through, and I, I, I got up and, and came into Bibi sitting around the, the kitchen table there, and I said, look, look at this. I said, God has a way of just motivating you and energizing you. When you look back, you're like, wow. I was looking at the pictures. We moved in this building because the vision was that we'd move in June the 2nd. A lot of you knew that. A lot of you were here. What I had forgotten and what I wasn't aware of is May 18th, where you're sitting, the floors were not finished. There were no chairs, and the carpet had not been laid. No cove base was around the rooms. And I thought, wow, if I'd have been removed from the vision, and somebody walked up to me and said, you need to do this before June the 2nd, I would have fainted. And I don't faint. Why? Because it was a lot. And I didn't do it alone. I mean, many of you sitting here, uh, you know, you had such a part in that. Uh, Charlie, you were, you were painting a lot of doors about that time, wasn't you? Yeah. And because I, I said the carpet wasn't laid, Charlie said, yeah, the doors weren't painted neither. I think it was right the week before May 18th, we had, uh, Ed just hung the first door. We're moving in June the 2nd. Why am I telling you this? I'm not telling you just to talk about the building. I'm telling you as you step into the vision God has for you, don't worry about all the particulars of how it's going to work. Just get seated in him. Seek the kingdom first and watch God manifest his glory in your life in every area of it. You'll see clearer the closer you get. How many of you know when you're taking an eye exam? If you get close enough, well, depending on if you're far or nearsighted, but depending on that, whichever way you go towards the chart, your, your vision improves. So if you have the right vision and you have the right perspective and you put the right light on it, you'll see it. Vision has a lot to do with light. 
I didn't realize this till my father-in-law had an operation several years ago. I'd never known anybody to have this operation. His eyesight was good, but he couldn't see good because his eyelids was darkening his vision. When they tucked his eyelids up, he had a facelift. <laughs> when, they, when they pulled his eyelids up, he was able to see again. What was it? It was letting light in. What are you doing this morning with your vision? You're letting light in. The Word of God is a lamp unto your feet. It'll guide you. It'll lead you. And that's what we will do here this morning. Let's look at what the Lord says about vision. Proverbs 29, 18 in the King James Version says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. We talked about this last week just a little bit. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. One of the definitions in the Strong's Concordance for perish is to go back. To go back. In other words, where there is no vision for the future, people don't just stay where they're at, they go back. So when you look to the future, you, it's, it's never really an option for a Christian to say, I'm just happy where I'm at. We always got our eye on the prize. We talked about that last week. Reaching. It's the most contented life you'll ever live. I remember when I first got saved and got a hold of the Word of God, uh, Matthew 6, Sheila quoted it a minute ago. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Well, I'm a simple man. I thought, okay, what God's telling me is if I'll seek Him first, everything I need will be added, and guess what? He's faithful. That's so simple. And how we miss that, but we do, we all do. But seek first the what are you doing this morning? You're seeking first the kingdom of God. What do you do tomorrow morning when you get up and read your scriptures or do a devotion or pray or praise? What are you doing? You're seeking his kingdom, the way he does things. And all the other stuff, and it goes on in Matthew 6, it goes on and it talks about before that, it talks about clothing, food, uh, housing. Everything you could possibly need in this world is already provided. All we have to do is seek his way. It's interesting when you go all the way back to Genesis. God created everything we needed to eat, to live. Everything was created. Then he created man. He didn't create man and say, oh, what do we do with them? I've got these humans now. They're going to need to eat. They're going to need shelter. They're going to need all of this stuff. Wait a minute. We better do something. No. God doesn't work that way. He created everything we could ever possibly need and told us how to subdue it, how to live off the land, how to do things. And he said, now let's create man. I've got the planet ready. And guess what? Before you were ever born, God already had a plan. Jeremiah says, in my mother's womb, God knew me. So your plan, God hath created for you everything you ever need. That's why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and all this will be added to you. He knows as we seek him, the plan's right there. And we won't go backwards, we'll keep moving forward. The Message Bible does a really great job. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they'll stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. I love the Message Bible. And I understand this for those scholars in the room. The Message Bible is not a translation. It's a paraphrase. It's just a guy's opinion, if you will. It's not really uh, translated from the Greek or the Hebrew, but it's a good uh, paraphrase. I love reading it. What I think one of the reasons I love reading it is Eugene Peterson, which is with the Lord now, I've always been so impressed by this guy, even though I didn't know him. What impressed me was he wrote the whole Bible, and yet he, the largest church he ever pastored was about 50 people. But he knew what God had planned for him. He pastored 50, he touched millions. See, we've, we need to know what God's saying to us. If not, we'll get, our, we'll get stars in our eyes and go for something that God never intended for us to go for. More's not always better. It's just more. God-directed vision is what you want. 
Whatever it is. I could, I'll just use my own life. I could start next week traveling probably pretty much anywhere I wanted to. But I'm a pastor. I found that out after traveling two years. I knew it before I traveled. It was just confirmed that much more. I love you. I love this church. I love what God's doing here. I don't wrestle with that. Don't wrestle with what God shows you. The only thing worse than being blind, we mentioned this last week, is having sight but no vision. What's a vision? What's God saying to you? And don't let anybody get you off of it. I think we're society, and I know in ministry this happens, people get to thinking, well, my vision is just not important because it's, you know, it's compared to everybody else's, it's just so small. Now, there's nothing that God tells us to do that's small. Nothing. It's not been but a month or two ago, there's a little girl come back there to the back door. Somebody brought her, I think it was Cindy brought her back there, and she said she wants to get saved. That's not a small thing. That's a major thing. God just allowed me and Cindy to be in, the, in a position there to, to lead this young girl to Christ. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. Nothing small in God's eyes. Not when he tells you to do it. Vision, the ability to think about or plan the future as rebuilt, revealed by God. To see the invisible. How do you do this? I said last week, and I want to repeat it for those that weren't here, and just to reiterate it to those that were. Find you a spot that you enjoy viewing, whether it be the woods, a pond, a lake, an ocean, or whatever it may be, a picture in your room at home, or whatever. Find you a spot that's comfortable, and spend just a little bit of time talking to the Lord, but more importantly, spend some time listening. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and we were the worst at it. We prayed. The, we, did not believe God, we did not believe God heard you unless you was loud, and everybody prayed at once. But I found out that you got to hear the one that's speaking to you. Prayer is not a monologue. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. Like the one preacher said, he said, after praying in the Spirit and crying and hollering at God, laying on the floor, he, he finally got a revelation. He said, here lies a fool. I'm doing all the talking to the one that knows everything. Meditation and listening to the Lord is so important. And you say, what do I, what do I meditate on? Whatever, whatever's in your heart. You say, well, I don't know that many scriptures. So, God knows you. And I found out he can even speak redneck. Amen? God will speak to you who you are. This is why, let me just give you, I know this is a very practical message, but I want you to get this. When I started with Christ, I would hear people tell their big visions. I'm like, I don't even have one. One of the first, one of the first preachers, me and Pastor Ed was talking about him the other day, he's home with Jesus now, Brother Elwood Matthews. One of the first preachers I sat down and had a conversation with about the call on my life, he told me his vision, and I'm like, well, I don't guess I've got one. This guy went all over the world evangelizing. I mean, he really made an impact on the world, and I know a lot of friends, and some of them sitting here that he made an impact on. And, and we were in his office. First time I ever met him, he talked to me for about two, two and a half hours. Told me his whole testimony, how he got saved, how God called him into ministry. I still remember it just like it was mine. But the vision was, he said, he, God, God, in a dream, God had him hung out over hell. And he seen people just walking off a cliff into hell. And he knew he was called to preach the gospel and to get people saved. And I was like, wow. So I'm thinking, well, I just feel like God wants me to do something. <laughs> And guess what? God's okay with that. I'm telling you this to help you. Sometimes people think God calls them to a business. And, and let me just say this, because I see a lot of business owners in here. Because you're a business owner, you're no less in the kingdom of God than somebody that's serving full-time in the ministry. There is no difference. When we get to heaven, there'll be preachers that God said, I called you to be a doctor. 
There'll be doctors or lawyers or business owners. He said, I called you to preach the gospel. Now, the good thing is, his grace, we still get in. If we're saved, that's all that matters. But we'll find out some pretty rude awakening stuff if we don't get a hold of vision. Your vision, whatever it is, will make a difference in God's kingdom. Amen? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Here's how we, we let's just recap just what we've talked about. You get with the Lord, you hear an unction in your heart. It could be a scripture, it could be some, God reminding you, of, reminding you of something he said to you when you were a kid. He reminds you, I know he reminded my wife when she was, I don't know, how, how old were you when you wanted to be a nun? She wanted to be a nun. I think she would have made a good nun. She, she just wanted to help people. So when she married a pastor... God reminded her of her prayer to want to serve people. And she's an excellent pastor's wife. Can somebody say amen? amen. Yeah. She's got a lot to take care of. <laughs> I'll never forget, over at the other church, there was a lady visiting us from out of town, and she, she, she greeted me and Bibi in the back, and I must have been in pretty rare form that morning, and she looked at Bibi, and I think she may have even grabbed her hand. She said, bless your heart, you got your hands full. <laughs> Bibi said, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> Uh, but here, here's how we, we hear God, we write down what we hear, big, small, insignificant in our mind, just write it down. Let God, let God birth something in you. And then, how do we proceed? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a great place to start. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. I wish I had a, well, this will work. The mic stand is your understanding. Don't feel like you always have to lean on that. No. Don't lean on on your own understanding. What's your own understanding? God tells you to do something, say, I don't have finances for that. God tells you to, to witness to somebody, I don't know enough scriptures to do that. God tells you to start a business, I did one time and I failed. That's your own understanding. But when you get out of your understanding and say, just go for it. And then acknowledge him in every way. I was talking about the building earlier. I, I think you're aware of this, but if not, let me make you crystal clear on this. None of this would have took place if we'd have leaned on our own understanding. God said a simple phrase to me back over on Inner Street that carried me through this project. And it was simply this. It was early one morning I was over there praying. And he said, if you'll take the steps, I'll build the church. And I can tell you with a clear conscience before God, God, God governed me. There was times where I knew I couldn't get excited. Sheila was talking about the shell of the building. I knew we had to have X amount of dollars before I could get excited to come in here and start doing anything or having people to do anything. And God would govern that. And there was times where I just knew I needed to be here and I would show up and God would show up. Lean not on your own understanding. It'll let you down. And let me just take it one step farther. Don't lean on the other understanding of other people. Sometimes people have great intentions. I was thinking yesterday, I think it was, or this morning. One of my greatest influence, counsels in my life, encouraged me that it was okay to go in debt. Encouraged it strongly. When we was building the building. Good time to borrow money? Encourage me strongly in that. Now let me clarify something. That individual was not wrong to encourage me from a natural standpoint. I would have been wrong if I'd have took the counsel knowing God had a different plan. I would have leaned on his understanding. I would have leaned on natural understanding. Because in the natural it made no sense for a church this size to build debt free. 
Some of the things God's calling you to doesn't make sense in the natural. It's okay. God's able. The message Bible says trust, the, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure it out, everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. There is no incidents. Where's Mike Russell? Is he back there with the youth? Yeah. Uh, what was Mike? I can't say it. Uh, God, say it again. God sedents. Some Mike, if anybody knows him, he'll come up with words. He's about as bad as his pastor. Uh, but he calls it God's incidents, or somehow he says it. What does that mean? It means you're a child of God. And he said, you'll know the path, and there's one behind you. Isaiah said, there's one behind you speaking. Just listen to him. The church has really been duped in a lot of ways. And, 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 and I know this sometimes sounds negative, but I'm just pointing out an obvious fact. It's so, so many times in church denomination in certain areas of ministry, people would convince people that they couldn't hear from God. Th that's the number one thing that you need to settle today that you, as a child of God, hears the shepherd's voice. Now, I've never heard God audibly. Let's be crystal clear about that. I never deny someone else saying they have. But I've heard God so strong in my spirit and in my heart that you could have been talking to me and it wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to hear you. Why? Because I just knew it was the Lord. But you can hear from God and while you're practicing, get in his word because every word's written for you. So you know you can hear him there. Jeremiah 29, 11. Before we read that, let me just keep, keep you posted here. here. Here's vision. You seek God first. You hear what he's directing. And sometimes God will direct you from a past experience. You say, he'll remind you of an event and how he brought you through it. And you're like, oh, that's the answer. Or he'll remind you of someone else that went through an event and you'll draw encouragement from that. You're like, well, they done it. I can do it. Or he'll just show you in Scripture. But as he does that and as you lean not on your own understanding or others' understanding, you lean on the Word, you stand on the Word, then here's the next part of that. you got to know that you know that God's got a good plan. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Most of the time we quit reading right there. There's something attached to 29, 11. As I've said many times, don't you ever pick one scripture and just hang your hat on it. You better read before and after it to make sure you have a clear understanding of what God's saying. Otherwise, you'll, if you don't keep scripture in context, you take, the, you, take the context, you take the text out, you end up with the con. That's just like for years people said, and my God will supply all of your riches according to his glory. And people shouted, woo, yeah. We forgot to tell them he was talking to tither and offering givers. We convinced people that they didn't have to get involved in what God was doing. No, there's things God requires of us not to be saved it's by grace through faith you're saved there's nothing you can do or add to that be clear on that but there is things that appropriate what God wants to do in your life and two when you do the things God wants you to do you keep the enemy at bay you don't let him in it says here's what he says in 12 he's got a good plan in verse 12 and 13 he said when you call on me and when you come and pray I'll listen when you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. Remember John Bevere years ago made a statement, and I still use it today. He said, I asked God, to, I went into a room, shut the door, and told God I wasn't leaving until he was on the throne of my heart. That's powerful. I'm going to seek God above everything else. Now, here's what I have found. Before you get nervous and before you get to, the devil gets to telling you, well, you ain't got time for that. You've got to work. It usually don't take but about three to five minutes to get everything straightened out. 
I've had God to, I've walked into my office or in, in somewhere and just sat down and just asked the Lord and it wasn't no time. Now sometimes it was longer. Sometimes you spend time seeking the Lord for a long period of time. But don't be duped that it's always that way. God knows your schedule better than you know it. Listen, if he knows how many hairs you got on your head, you don't. Somebody give me a number. How many you got? You know? Nobody knows that. And the Bible says God knows it. Well, if he knows that, he knows where you need to go next. So seek him. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come. This was Jesus speaking here. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. As I've told the Bible college students over and over again, especially if we're teaching theology and we're, we're teaching scripture, this to me is the dividing line of where our faith starts. In other words, I've got to believe God is good. I've got to get rid of any type of man-made religion that says things like, well, God put that on you to teach you something. That's not the God we serve. Well, yeah, but pastor, you don't understand. I was sick and, and, I, I was, and, and God really taught me something. Well, yeah, I don't deny that. God will teach you sick or well if you'll let him. But to say a loving God put the sickness on you to teach you something when he wrote 66 books to teach you that? He said, the thief, the devil, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said he came to give us life and that more abundantly. Now, how many of you have ever been sick? It wouldn't have mattered if you had $15 billion in the bank. If you don't feel like spending it, you're not living abundantly. Would everybody say amen? You don't, you don't feel like doing anything. It wouldn't matter what you possessed. Abundant life is all-inclusive. God wants you, the word salvation means so-so, it means everything complete. Nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing lacking in your life. That, the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's in heaven? No more tears, no more pain, no more sickness. You say, well, that, is that going to happen? That's what we need to believe for. Now, we have a temporary, if you will, redemption to this body, but when we get a glorified, when we don't have to believe for anything anymore, it's all good. But God instructs us to believe, to receive everything he has for us. And here's what he says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. You have Holy Spirit power working in you the once you got born again. And when the church teaches or forgets to teach about the Holy Spirit, we miss it all. Think about it. He said, you've got power, unlimited power working in you. This is why I've said for years, ever since I've been a pastor, if you work at a public job, you should be getting promotions all the time. Why? Because you serve the one that knows all of it. If you own your own business, you should be flourishing in it. Why? Why? Because God will speak to you. Now, it's still up to us whether we listen or not. And there's no condemnation when we miss it. That's the loving God we serve. But God wants you to live an abundant life. He wants you to live a full life. One translation says life to the full. Malachi said he'll open when you're a tither. He'll, again, there's something there for us to do. When we're a tither, he said he'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you can't receive. The Message Bible says, I love this, so simple, I'll close with this scripture. God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us his spirit deeply and gently 
within us. See, all God's got to do is whisper that it's okay. And guess what? The problem may still exist, but you know it's okay. I remember November, no, October of 1996. Many of you have heard this story. I was about to lose things. I didn't have any income. It was a pretty bad. As I've said many times, if you'd have seen me October of 1996, the last thing you would have said about me was that guy will be my pastor. You may have said something like, we need to call the people with the white coats because I was a mess. Wednesday night, I was, about, I was getting ready to go to church, just like you. I believe saved people go to church, and I believed I was supposed to be in church. I was in dire straits, didn't know how I was going to do it, didn't know what was happening. I was getting ready to take a shower, and in my spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, asked a question. He said, what if you lose everything? What if you lose it all? And these words came out of my mouth for the first time in my life. It is well with my soul. For the first time in my life, I could have died right there. I knew where I was going. It put everything in perspective. And to this day, my wife will tell you, I don't fret over money. Why? Because we have an endless supply. Whatever, God, whatever you, God needs you to do, he'll supply it. It may take you some time to, to, to pray and get all that, you know. But God's faithful. And again, go back to the, the thing he said. Even if the money don't show up. Even if we'd had to borrow money on this building. It wasn't my project. It was God's. I didn't lose any sleep over it. Why? Because God, God had it. And he's got you. He's got you. He, he's not going to push you around. He's going to lead you gently. Write it down. We talked about that last week. Write down anything. Anything God speaks to you. First three years I saw a vision for the church. Only thing God wanted to talk to me about was my family. I'm so thankful. I wanted a vision for a church. <laughs> I wanted him to say, build this, go here, invite this person in, read this, do this. And he wanted to talk to me about my family. I'm so thankful. If he hadn't, I'd have lost him. You say, are you sure about that? Yeah, pretty big on his mind. I still hadn't, I still hadn't achieved and still hadn't become the dad or the granddad I intend to be. But I work at it. At least he got me on the path. I didn't say I've arrived, like Paul said last week. Not that I've obtained, but I'm pressing. And see, that's what we're all doing. We'll arrive when we see Jesus face to face. Until then, let's just keep pressing in. Life lesson is this. What we focus on is what we'll see. Let's focus on what these scriptures tell us, what we've been looking at today. God is good, and he has a great plan for our lives. Focus on that. God. Everybody say this. God is good to me. Do this. Say, to me. Yeah, he is. Say it again. God is good to me. One more time. God is good to me. Man, I wish someone would have told me that years ago. Because what I heard was, boy, if you don't straighten up, God's about to knock your block off. Did I need to straighten up? Yes. No denying it. And they didn't know what they didn't know. I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. It's the love of God that leads all men to repentance. When you find out how good God really is, why wouldn't you serve him? And that's the whole point of what we're talking about. What you see is what will happen. Now, me and B.B., we see things differently, don't we, honey? 
And it's been a great for our marriage. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. The revelation God gave me after we got married is when iron is being sharpened, any of you guys ever sharpened a lawnmower blade or something? Sparks are flying. <laughs> now, the scripture don't say that, but tell, I want to tell you something. It does happen. How many of you that are married know this, okay? We'll sharpen one another, but the sparks will fly sometimes, There's, especially if you're passionate people. But we see things differently, and I'm going to try to help you as we close here. Yesterday, you didn't know I was going to tell this, did you? Yesterday, I had a piece of trim on the top of our house where a tree would, had taken down, but the trim was already loose, just a piece of aluminum siding on the, on the soffit there. And it was flapping, and I knew the wind, the way it was blowing yesterday, I thought, if I don't fix it today, I may not have it to fix. It may be down the street somewhere. And so I stood the ladder up. It's a 28-foot 20, ladder. And so, you know, I don't care who you are. They get a little wobbly. This was a good ladder, okay? So I told Bibi, I said, you know, I'll feel safer if you're out here with me, you know. Uh, just give me some moral support. That was a mistake. <laughs> I should have went on up the ladder and done my business. And picked up. <laughs> Nick come by right after we got done and BB confessed what she seen and then I confessed what I seen. What she seen was me falling off the ladder, breaking my back and breaking her neck. <laughs> what I seen was three screws running the, the piece of metal and we were done. Now, what am I saying in this? You may be a BB. You may see that thing in the bad sense at first. But take the scripture and turn it. Because she will. She has a title for who she is, if I can remember it. She is a pessimistic optimist. Optimistic pessimist. I still ain't decided if I, you know, I make up words too, so I'll give her some slack. But, but whatever you see, the point being is this. Whatever you see, make sure it lines up with John 10.10. 10. The thief come to steal. Jesus said, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. Refuse in 2020. Receive in 2020 vision. You refuse absolutely refuse to see what the enemy's painting for you. Oh, he's going to paint a, 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 a terrible picture because he does it with me. Many times in this building project, I've seen us sitting here with a half-built building in the hall of the neighborhood laughing. But I refuse to believe that because God had already told me, you take the steps, I'll build the church. Well, guess what? I kept walking. And your business, your family, same thing. Whatever you hear come out of the pulpit, you should be grabbing a hold for yourself. When I was sitting there and someone else was pastoring me, Pastor Whitfield would say something. I'm like, hey, God told him to say it. Work for him. Work for me. God's not a respecter of a person. And God, it'll work for you. Amen. Amen.